Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of the New Farm Neighbourhood Centre and Communify Queensland. I'd like to introduce you to Margot Donnell, who's going to be our MC for the evening, and she's also going to do Welcome to Country. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Powerhouse and to Politics in the Pub. Thank you all for coming. Um, it's evident by the numbers of you here that this is a topic that is um, of great interest to many of you, in fact, probably to all of us, really. Um, I was thinking as I prepared for it, this is a topic, the topic of euthanasia and the way we die, um, that has legal, medical, pharmaceutical, political, um, familial implications, spiritual implications for, uh, for our for individuals and for the community. So it really straddles a lot of very complex areas of um, concern and thought. I'd like to um, welcome you all. I've done that. I'd like to acknowledge um, country, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay our respects to their ancestors, past and present. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the new farm, the wonderful New Farm Neighbourhood Centre, um, who promote and put together these politics in the pub. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. The idea is to have community conversations about important topics and uh, so that we can share our views and hear others' views in a uh, helpful and educative environment. So um, more power to Neighbourhood Centre and there'll be more coming. We'll talk about that later. So this is how it's going to work. I may look like a girl, but I'm really Tony Jones tonight. Um, so <laughs> it's going to be a bit like a Q&A format. So because we have six speakers and they all um, are very involved in and, um, you know, are very knowledgeable about their area of interest and expertise, uh, rather than each one of them make a, um, a sort of a speech, I'm going to kick off with some questions for a, and, and then have a discussion across... Uh, people for about 40 minutes and 45 minutes and then I'll throw it open to the floor for um, questions and answers. Um, and before I go further, I actually, I will introduce the panellists, but I particularly want to uh, welcome the panellists here tonight and thank them for giving us their time. Um, I want to remind you about our code of conduct. That is, this conversation and this discussion will be respectful. Um, Questions, please, rather than statements from the floor. Um, we're here to hear from the panellists, so um, long statements perhaps um, should be cut shorter. Um, and if possible, if you'd like to direct your questions to a particular speaker, I don't think every question will be answered by every one of the panellists. We won't simply have time and it won't give you enough time to ask your questions. So if you can be as specific as possible, that would be terrific. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the standby crisis support workers. Um, they're in a grey shirt with a standby lo logo. Would you like to put your hands up, guys? Thank you. Over there on the right, my right, down the back. Um, they will be available during and after the event for anyone who would like to talk with them. And they will gather probably either here or down the back um, to be available to any of you afterwards. And for those of you who are on social media, our hashtag is um, number Pip New Farm. <laughs> hash. Is that what hash is? Yes. yes. <laughs> As you can see, I'm a really regular tweeter, uh, etc. I refuse um, to. <laughs> okay. So that's that. I'd now like to introduce you to the panellists. And I'll start on my right with Dr. David Swanton. Dr. David Swanton is the Director of Ethical Rights and the ACT Chapter Coordinator for Exit International. David is an ethicist with a doctorate in theoretical chemistry. He has been an active participant in euthanasia issues for 20 years, running Dying with Dignity and then Exit International in the ACT during that time. He's established a consultancy called Ethical Rights to provide information and to challenge people on ethical, human rights, scientific and related issues. Would you welcome David? Thanks. 
Sitting in the middle um, on my right is Professor Colleen Cartwright. Professor Colleen Cartwright was Foundation Professor of Age Services at the Southern Cross University from 2005 until April 2014, after 20 years at the University of Queensland. She's now Emer Emeritus Professor at Southern Cross University and Principal Director of Cartwright Consulting. Much of her research and teaching has involved ethical and legal issues relating to care at the end of life, in, including advanced care planning, patient advocacy, informed consent and capacity, the right to adequate pain relief, what is and what is not euthanasia, issues for carers, and the special challenges of caring for people with dementia. Would you welcome Colleen? Julie Borger, on my ne right next to me, on my right, began actively campaigning against euthanasia over 10 years ago, believing that values such as the right to choose were usurping the intrinsic value of human life. In 2009, Julie attended the World Congress of Families in Amsterdam, where she heard from politicians in the Netherlands speak about the impact of euthanasia on their communities. She was a delegate at the Southern Hemisphere's first No Euthanasia Symposium in Adelaide, which featured numerous international speakers. Julia's had a long involvement with, the Cherish, Life Queens with Cherish Life Queensland and recently became president. She considers euthanasia to be a key social debate issue for the next 10 to 20 years. Would you welcome Julie? <laughs> Sharon, on my left here, is the Vice President of Dying with Dignity Queensland. Sharon lost four precious loved ones over the space of five years, an experience, she says, which brought dying and death into very sharp focus and gave her an awareness of how the experience can be actually improved. She was already working as a spiritual counsellor and her business became focused on serving the dying, their loved ones and medical professionals. Through her work, Sharon has seen firsthand the agony caused by the absence of voluntary euthanasia laws. This compelled her to become actively involved with Dying with Dignity, Queensland, and to work towards creating legislative change. Would you welcome Sharon? <laughs> Dr Maureen Mitchell in the middle completed her primary medical degree in Western Australia and initially trained as a general practitioner. She's completed specialist training in palliative medicine and works for the Wesley Palliative Care Service. Maureen has worked in a variety of clinical settings, including caring for dying patients in remote Indigenous communities of Western Australia and the Northern Territory. She is currently assisting in curriculum development for medical students at the University of Queensland um, to introduce palliative medicine principles and explore complex issues relating to death and dying. Would you welcome Maureen? And last but not least, Reverend Canon Richard Tewton, born and raised in Queensland. The Reverend Canon Richard Tewton is an Anglican priest who has worked in both parish and non-parish ministries. Ordained in 1977, he has served in parishes throughout Queensland and Tasmania and as a lecturer in, of biblical studies in New South Wales. Richard has had extensive experience in ecumenical ministry and activities, including as a broadcaster on Christian radio, in October 2011, Richard became the General Secretary of the Ecumenical Christian Body, Christian Churches Together, a role which he holds to this day. Would you welcome Richard? Okay, so let's get going. What I thought we might do um, is first define what we're talking about. So I was going to start with you, Colleen, because you, um, you had something in your bio about discussing and being aware of the different kinds of euthanasia. So could you give us a definition of euthanasia and could you also explain what is meant by voluntary and involuntary euthanasia? Yes, thanks, Marg. Well, firstly, I never use the term involuntary. The only term I think should be applied to euthanasia is active voluntary euthanasia. And I define that as a deliberate act intended, and that's the most important word in the definition, intended to end the life of the patient at that patient's request for what he or she sees as being in his or her best interest. So it's active, it's voluntary, and it's euthanasia in its original meaning of a good or peaceful death. Now, other terms that are sometimes used, like non-voluntary or involuntary or whatever, um, I believe a subterfuge, and some of them, in fact, could be murder, 
whereas the term euthanasia itself is not. I think one of the important things is to be very clear about what is not euthanasia. For example, giving adequate pain relief, which may risk hastening death, is not euthanasia. Um, the, uh, it's called the doctrine of double effect, and I know that some of the palliative care specialists don't like that term, but it, for me it explains it very, very well. The um, doctrine of double effect means that your primary intention is to ease pain. A foreseen but unintended secondary consequence may be, but usually isn't, hastening death by a few hours or days. Now, this is accepted by most religious and medical groups, including those who strongly oppose euthanasia. For example, the Catholic Church accepts the doctrine of double effect because the first person to use the term was St. Thomas Aquinas. And Aquinas said, if you must achieve a good end, in this case, relief of pain, and the only way you can um, achieve that good end is to also run the risk of a foreseen but unintended secondary consequence, i.e. hastening death by a few hours or days. Now, let me say to you, leaving a terminally ill person in pain is a human rights abuse, and I'd like um, to talk Colleen. more about that later. Yeah, mm -hmm. Colleen, we're doing definitions just at the minute. Okay, so the, okay. Second, the second thing that is not euthanasia is withdrawing or withholding so-called life support systems that are doing nothing more than prolonging someone's dying. My research shows lots of people say things like he, we couldn't even get close enough to give him a hug and say goodbye because he was hooked up to so many machines. Removing a futile treatment is not euthanasia. And respecting a patient's right to refuse further treatment is absolutely a legal and moral right and is also not euthanasia. Can I just interpose? So when people fill in an advanced health directive which says, I don't want to be resuscitated, that's what you're referring to right now. That's, they're not asking for euthanasia, they're asking for, for not, the non-continuation. They're asking not to have their dying prolonged artificially. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Anyone um, d disagree with those definitions or want to add just to our understanding of what we're talking about? No? Okay. Um, what about the... What about the issue of, um, would someone like to comment on this, um, the idea that people who starve themselves um, and allow themselves to become dehydrated, is that a form of voluntary euthanasia? Or, um, you know, wh what is that? Is there a term for that? David, do you want to comment well, on that? Often, oh, and thank you, every, the organisers, for inviting me here today as well. People who starve themselves and people who are dehydrated at the end often have no choice. When my mother died last year, the palliative care options were no food and no drink in the last week. And that's not a nice way to go. Now, she did not have euthanasia, but with three days to go, she said, I want, I want to get out now. And we've got to have a, a better situation in Australia so that we don't have such terrible deaths occurring. Yes, quickly, Just quickly. And then, um, sure. But yeah. don't confuse that with the fact that at the end stage of life, when someone has entered their dying, generally they do not want food and fluid. And if you continue to provide it, particularly artificial nutrition and hydration, not only can you increase their suffering, you can deprive them of a peaceful death. Because if the body, doesn't, uh, the body gets the signal that death is approaching and releases endorphins that act like a natural analgesic, gives the person a natural high. If you continue to feed and hydrate them when they've passed the point where they want that, when the kidneys are shutting down, you can increase their suffering and deprive them of a peaceful death because the body doesn't get the signal. And in the last week of life, most people do not want to eat and drink and they are not stuff suffering starvation and they are not suffering dehydration. Thanks. Maureen, did you want to add? I guess I was going to um, add to it. I can't really add to what Colleen says, but certainly looking after people that are dying, um, and you know, I can make no comment about your mother's case, but looking after people that are dying, as you die, your body is shutting down piece by piece by piece. Each organ is failing. It isn't just you're okay and then it all fails. It's a slow, gradual process. This is not acute dying, getting run over by a car or anything else like this. This is a body that is slowly dying. And certainly one of the first organs that shuts down is the gut. The gut is 
is shut down because the body wants to use the blood for other purposes. So it will not want to actually put a lot of effort into getting nutrition out of, out of whatever you've put in there. And for many times, if we actually put food in either through a nasogastric tube or through a peg tube, what ends up happening is that food's not digested. It, it is then at risk of, of being taken back up and actually yes, sprayed it into the lungs, which will just add to the problems. So for many patients that I care for that are dying, they don't want to eat, they don't want to drink, and it is part of the natural process. They usually have plenty of nutritional capacity still and still quite a lot of fluid in their body. The studies that we have done looking at people at level of dehydration as they die does not show that people are significantly dehydrated. When you are in comfortable areas without a lot of, you know, you're not active in terms of losing fluid through sweating, your kidneys are concentrating the fluid, your need for fluid is actually much less. And I've had patients who have not been able to take any fluid and they've lived for weeks and weeks and it's not dying of a dehydration, they are dying of the underlying disease process. Thanks for uh, explaining that. That's terrific to uh, have that cleared up. Can I just check, can you people down the back here? No. Okay. Could, when you're speaking, can you move as close as possible to the microphones as, as possible? That would be great. Um, Julie, you're the president, president of Cherish Life, an organisation which opposes voluntary euthanasia. Where would you suggest people turn if a loved one or a family member was suffering... Um, great pain, unbearable and untreatable pain, and wanted to die. What would you do about that? Or what would you recommend people do about that? So I'll be talking about the person wanting to die or the family members? The person. For the, for the purposes of this discussion. All right, all right, because often it's the family members that are really rather wishing it out of compassion because it hurts them to hurt, see their loved ones in pain. Uh, my response to that would be that in... 95% of cases nowadays, adequate and um, proper palliative care actually can, make, can reduce pain and put people out of their misery. I know there's some statistics that say that up to 50 to 70% of people do experience pain, and I would say to that that there is not enough money spent on training palliative care workers or in funding palliative care because we should be able to do it properly. And so I would still be, if I was a family member, I would be doing all I could to get the adequate and appropriate medical interventions for my family member whom I love so that he is or she is comfortable. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what you think, Richard, about that issue. Because practically all the churches that I represent as GenSec of uh, Queensland churches together have at the heart of their theology is sacredness of life. Um, m practically all of them uh, look at, at avenues of, pa of palliative care because it's, it's suffering that they don't want people to, to, to suffer too much. Um, though they, they don't want people to... All the um, teachings and the theology at the moment says that, that um, a lot of churches are against... Um, voluntary or, or assisted euthanasia it certainly doesn't mean that they want people to suffer and uh, of course um, the, the teaching of the Catholic Church has already been quoted about um, painkiller um, being administered as, as the patient desires uh, a lot of other churches would agree with that and uh, so there's that, that element of, of trying to alleviate suffering and of course palliative care and other means and palliative, palliative care does not necessarily, I believe, need to take place in a hospital. It can happen at home in familiar surroundings and, uh, and people um, are able to, uh, to, to be assisted in that particular way. But the whole idea of, of making sure people don't suffer too much is really at the heart of what a lot of churches are, are saying at the moment. Yeah. Sharon? I'd just like to ask Julie, Palliative Care Australia says themselves that they cannot help 100% of the people 100% of the time. So for those that palliative care, even 
as spectacular as it can be and needs to be, even as the best it can be, there are still people that aren't going to help. What happens to those people? Yes, that is a difficult one, isn't it? And it's just heart-wrenching for any of us to think of anyone for whom palliative care is not working and they are in pain. But I think I'd say back to that, that um, just because from time to time you have a horrific murder situation, you don't want to introduce capital punishment again, and, uh, and the same argument can be used uh, for, for abortion when only really 1% or less uh, are, are, you know, of conceptions are, are the result of rape. So I think that you can't make bad laws based on very a few situations. You have to really look at the bigger picture. Can I get get back to you, Sharon? Um, What is your response to the idea that euthanasia presents a moral slippery slope? That once we allow some people to choose to die, it becomes sort of normalised and opens opens possible floodgates for more assisted deaths? I'd like to first address your phrase of choose to die. Mm -hmm. Um, Newsflash. We're all going to die. So that's, that's off the table. The choose to die, what we're talking about here is people who are dying anyway. We're talking about mercy. We're talking about compassion. We're not talking willy-nilly, broad-based, let's just lock everybody off, OK? The slippery slope comes into play with our legislators and creating robust legislation that has the safeguards in place And this concept of the slippery slope is, well, once we've got this, then we're going to have that, then we're going to have that, then we're going to have that. There's no guarantees. That's all fear-based propaganda based on potentialities. It doesn't address the very current reality of people suffering at the moment. Where are we as a compassionate society? Are we just going to ignore these few percent because it's just too awkward and too difficult? Maureen? Maureen? Would you like to comment? What, in terms of looking after people right it, to the very end regardless? Is that what we're yeah, talking no, about? Yeah, really the moral the question about... Slippery d- slope. Do you, open, do you open up some sort of floodgates if you legalise this? Uh, I'm not too sure about a floodgate, but, you know, the older I become, the less black and white I see things. You know, everything is a shade of grey and sort of it goes... You, I don't think that there's going to be necessarily a floodgate opened. I don't believe that. I don't think those floodgates have been particularly opened elsewhere in other countries where it's been legalised. So that's not such an issue I, I don't feel, as long as the legislation is correct and written properly. And there's just a lot of questions about how you write legislation that protects the majority of people in a country where democracy is meant to rule. So, you know, I I guess that's kind of um, the concerns that I have about any of this, but I have lots of concerns about lots of legislation that's written. So, you know, it's my cynicism about um, politicians. I'm sorry if there's any in the audience. (laughs) But, um, but, yeah, I I, I don't know. I I hear the term all the time. You know, there's lots of terms bandied around about lots of things, you know, double effect. Yes, I'm one of those doctors where I don't really necessarily believe in double effect. But, you know, lots of people do. So I, I don't know. I haven't answered that question at all. Sorry. No, no, but that's anyway. okay. Oh, it's, compl- it's complex, yes. I wanted David and David, you next and then Colleen. The slippery, the slippery slope is really an argument for those who can't think up an argument. It just means... <laughs> it just means change could be wrong because we say it's going to be wrong. We elect politicians who, as regulators, enact legislation that set the limits on what is legal and not legal. They will set the bounds. If killing non-terminally ill people via euthanasia is illegal, it will be illegal. That's what they set the rule to be. If it changes in 50 years or 100 years' time, that is what the regulators at the time will set it to be. There is also no international evidence that there is a slippery slope Indeed, I could argue it's going to be a reverse slippery slope. In other words, I belong to Exit International, Philip Nitschke's group. Thousands of Australian grandparents have illegal drugs now. Involuntary euthanasia is incurring... Oh, sorry, Colleen. Not involuntary euthanasia, but doctors have admitted that they are helping people to die at the moment um, and they have not had an explicit request from that patient. 
with regulated voluntary euthanasia, doctors will not need to second guess what people think. People will only have voluntary euthanasia if they request it. So it would probably be a more of a reverse situation that the instance of euthanasia occurring without an explicit request will decrease. And just one final comment on the 95% of people who palliative care helps. It's the 5% of people that it can't help. And nobody here knows more about my body than me. So I find it rather arrogant in a way that others can dare tell me how, what I should do with my life. Yes, Colleen. Thank you, Margaret. And just before I talk about the slippery slope, I wonder, Richard, I was just delighted to hear you say that all of the churches in your group um, are committed to not having people suffering and in pain because one of the Catholic bishops, um, I heard him say not so very long ago that suffering and pain at the end of life is uplifting and redeeming. <laughs> and I just wondered whether it would be... He obviously wasn't in pain. And I just wondered whether, in fact, it would be sinful of me to hope that he is very uplifted and redeemed at the end of his life. <laughs> um, but... In, in t- <laughs> Sorry, I can't help being wicked. Oh, well, it's fine. Um, Hang on, there's... The, are you finished, Yeah, I'll respond Colleen? in a little while. I'll, I'll just um, talk about the slippery slope because I have to agree. Um, there's, uh, some of you will know a very, very good palliative care specialist called Dr Linda Sheehan, and she did a lot of research on a Churchill Fellowship where she looked at the whole issue of euthanasia in all of the countries where it's legal and in others where other things similar happen. Um, and her conclusion, and she is not in favour of euthanasia, but her conclusion was there is no evidence of a slippery slope and there is no evidence of a slippery slope despite the fact that some people will point to the fact that in Belgium they did open the legislation to allow it to be applied to children I just have to say with the consent of their parents and being in a a, um, a, a situation where the only way to ease the suffering was to help end the the child's life I just have to ask how many of you say that it's absolutely okay for an adult to have their pain and suffering relieved but not a child. Um, But that's often used as an example of the slippery slope. Um, The evidence is not there. Many countries have had it for 20 years. And the point that David made about the reverse, when the Northern Territory legislation was introduced, at the time there was very little palliative care in the Territory. Um, I had been told before I went up there and did the research at the time the legislation was in place that there was none. That wasn't true. It was the Director of Palliative Care from Darwin that asked me to come up and do the research. (laughs) Um, But following the introduction of that legislation, palliative care in the Northern Territory increased dramatically because the politicians didn't want people choosing euthanasia instead because there wasn't adequate palliative care. Yep. Um, Maureen, you wanted to say something and then you, Julie. Yep. Uh, one of the things I just want to say is that you, there are a group of patients that their distress is something that I as a doctor cannot fix because their distress is something more than some physical or emotional pain whatever it is. A lot of discussion ends up around uncontrolled pain, but there's a lot of symptoms at the end of life that are difficult to control. I actually think that one of the symptoms that's probably the most distressing is not being able to breathe, not being able to breathe by, because of mesothelioma wrapped around your lungs, not being able to breathe because you've got um, multiple sclerosis or AML or something like that. Now, some of that distress that happens with that is also the distress of the destruction of the ego, that all of a sudden I'm I'm not going to survive any longer. And that's completely out of my realm, I can tell you here and now. And so there will be a group that we can't alleviate their pain or their distress or whatever it is that, that, that they're finding is intolerable. I agree with that. I know there's just an awful lot of discussion about people being in pain, We've come a long way with pain. That's my specialty, is controlling pain at the end of life. We've got an awful lot of drugs now. We've got an awful lot of procedures now. And so people dying in extreme pain is uncommon. If they're saying that they're dying in pain, there's always another aspect to that because pain is not just 
a small contained thing. It is layer upon layer upon layer of how that person interacts with their environment, how they lose their ability to be an independent creature, how they lose their connections with their community, with their family and everything else. That's a big issue. Mm. Um, and certainly those things are way beyond with this person's capacity to be able to fix. Mm. Thank so. you. It's helpful. I think often when we talk about the slippery slope, we are talking about uh, legislation to uh, legalise euthanasia and we look at situations of people that are with a terminal illness, uh, often aged and living in great pain. And so that's what is often legalised, euthanasia, with that context in mind. Now, if you look at some of the countries that have had euthanasia for quite a long time, I'm thinking of Holland since 2001, I'm thinking of Belgium since 2002. You can, the statistics there prove that euthanasia has extended beyond that group. And the Dutch government did their own Remy Link su- survey and found that there are approximately 1,000... Uh, euthanasia events every year that are unauthorised, that the patient has not requested. Is that not a slippery slope? Also, euthanasia in in that country is rising by 15% a year. You've now got in both those countries euthanasia for uh, children, and over 12 years, they don't even, parents can't even have a say. Uh, The child is deemed old enough to make that decision. In Belgium, it is having gone to a psychologist, and uh, if the patient and the psychologist together decide that the patient can make that decision, so be it. And we recently had in... um, in Holland, a 15-year-old child choose to commit suicide. I find it quite horrific that uh, these children are not old enough to decide whether to smoke or drive a car or have alcohol or, or, or get married, and yet they are somehow entrusted with that right. And I think, too, I'm a mother of four children, by the way. They're all old now, older now. But I think most of us would say that when we had our teenagers and the hormones were chick- kicking in at 12, 13, 14, all of our kids had days when they thought life wasn't worth living. I just don't think that uh, some of this recent uh, changes and extensions to the euthanasia, law, euthanasia laws can not be called anything but the slippery slope. Yes. Can I just comment to that? Um, there's been a report done by Canadian specialists looking into these, and they're called life terminating, knife terminating acts without explicit request. Now, the official government statistics out of Netherlands were in 2001, 0.7% of total deaths fell into this category, 0.4 in 2005, and in 2010, 0.2%, or 270 people of 136,000 deaths. Now, I'm going to quote directly here from the report that Canada did a very, very robust investigation into these life-terminating acts, and I'm quoting directly here. Further analysis of these cases show that they typically involve patients who are very close to death and are presently incompetent, but where there has been an earlier discussion about the hastening of death with them and all their relatives, and where opioids were used to end life. The most recent study also showed that about one-third of these cases can also be described as terminal sedation, cases in which high dosages of sedatives were given without hydrating the patient. The other point I'd also like to make, both Netherlands and Belgium, their laws are founded in unbearable suffering. They do not have specific context in terms of terminal illness. So that is a very, very different scenario to what is being proposed and discussed for here in Queensland, specifically in Australia in a broader context. So I have issues with those kind of statistics being quoted because it distracts the conversation. What we're talking is mentally competent, terminally ill adults. That's it. Can I just... The same Canadian survey? Um, David's been very keen to talk about that. I, David, can you talk about the Northern Territory experience? And Because it's useful to see how it has it worked, particularly in Australia. Yeah. Look, uh, Sharon's correct. Um, in Australia, I think what's proposed and uh, what's come out of the recent Victorian parliamentary inquiry is that um, 
voluntary euthanasia should just be for the terminally ill, and that's all that's been proposed in Australia. There was a rights of the terminally ill act in the Northern Territory, and as you would all be aware, Philip Nischke um, operated under that act, and four people died under that act. Um, at the, um, sometime later, uh, the Euthanasia Laws Act was enacted in the Federal Parliament, which um, prohibited the ACT, Northern Territory and Norfolk Island from enacting legislation. There is, of course, still a way around that, Northern, uh, that um, federal legislation, and if anyone wants to hear my views on that, they can talk to me later. But that legislation was for terminally ill people, and that, as Sharon said, or as most of the legislation around Australia has proposed, it talks about doctors assessing the patient. That a psychologist checks you over. A number of options to check the eligibility and operability of the Act, and as good public policy, there would be compliance, enforcement, and monitoring regimes. This is what happens in Holland. Sufficient compliance, enforcement, and monitoring regimes to ensure the legislation is not... No, it operates satisfactorily. So there's quite a few things we can do here. I just should add that as Ex International Philip Nitschke's group takes um, operates in Australia, we go a bit beyond what is proposed legislatively. In other words, for terminally ill patients, we have people coming to us who are just old, who want to die for whatever reason. Iris Flounders was in her 80s. Her husband Don died. She wanted to die at the same time. So what Philip Nischke does is provide information on end-of-life options to all sorts of people who are over 50 and who may or may not be terminally ill. Now, I think from a public policy perspective, it's only likely that terminally ill situations will get up in Australia. But please be aware that the debate has gone past this in Australia now. Many thousands of grandparents in Australia and tens of thousands around the world are importing and ma manufacturing illegal drugs to have in their cupboard or under a rock in their lo local park just in case they are terminally ill because the regulatory system is not adequate in Australia at the moment. I just wanted... Oh, wait, sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, I, yeah, I really won't be very long. I just want to quickly point out to people what happened with the Northern Territory legislation. Um, when, it was, when that legislation was passed, and I actually did the research in the Northern Territory while the legislation was in place, um, and had that legislation been passed in a state and not in a territory, it could not have been overturned under our constitution because while states, uh, territories can make health law, they can be overturned by the uh, Commonwealth Government. I, I just want to say that the road train that went around the Northern Territory led by Kevin Andrews, was one of the most dishonest things I've ever seen. Now, I've, stayed, I've managed to stay neutral on whether or not the law should be changed for 25 years, but I was outraged at the lies that were being told, particularly in the Aboriginal communities. One of my colleagues attended one of the meetings, and he was appalled at what was being said and stood up to correct it and was ordered out of the meeting. Um, that road train set the cause of Aboriginal health back 20 years in the Northern Territory. Old people stopped going to hospital because they were afraid they'd be euthanised. Um, mothers stopped having their babies immunised because they thought they were going to be euthanised. When the Commission of Inquiry called for submissions about whether or not that legislation should be overturned, when Prime Minister John Howard announced the results, he didn't exactly lie, but he didn't exactly tell the truth. I have in my garage all of the submissions that were made to that legislation and my um, uh, retirement project, if I ever do it, um, <laughs> will, retire, I mean, will be to write the book about what really happened. Because what happened was that the um, voluntary euthanasia societies around Australia took, um, took up petitions. Some of the petitions had as many as 4,000 signatures on them. Each submission was counted as one submission in favour of retaining the legislation. My brother, who was a practising Catholic, said that the priests across Australia were instructed to get up on the altars and ask people to come around to the presbytery and collect a form letter, which all they had to do was sign and send in. Um, every one of those letters counted as one submission against the legislation. So when you were told that X percent of submissions were in support and X percent of submissions were against, that wasn't exactly a lie, but it wasn't exactly the truth, and when I write the book, you'll know that. <laughs> I just wanted to make one comment about your Canadian study, because as you know, Canada... Um, 
legalised euthanasia earlier this year. So they have been, I suppose, travelling the world looking at euthanasia in countries. And one of their findings out of the Flemish part of Belgium was that 32% of euthanasias that occurred were unsolicited or um, not patient uh, requested. So that came out of the Canadian study as well. Um, hmm. um, I just wanted to get back and clarify something that, um, that David said that I just want to make clear that I've heard correctly. So is um, Exit International, um, it, it takes the euthanasia discu uh, discussion into a much broader place. That's what you're saying, that it, it, it's it, not about people in pain who are dying or even necessarily people who are extremely old. You're talking about people over 50 who, um, you know, who, want, who don't want to be here. Look, Would Exit right? has two main objectives, one of which is the secondary one is to ensure the regulation of voluntary euthanasia in Australia and the, and the Dying with Dignity groups around Australia are all working assiduously towards that, so we're very supportive of that. So Philip Nitschke is responding to patient demand and the demand of many elderly people who want something just in case. I'm not elderly yet, but I do want that option. I do want to know what I need to have in my cupboard just in case. Now, in case people don't know... There's a number of ways that Philip Nishki provides information. If you go to one of his workshops and some people say, look, I, might, I think I've got some cancer, I might want to die in six months, can I take an overdose of, overdose of paracetamol? He'll say, no, don't do that. That's a terrible way to go. You talk about the liver problems and other problems. But if you want to know what to do, the information will be provided that you can then know what to do to... Make sure that you have your end-of-life choices mapped out and you can provide for whatever you need to do. So that is above and beyond terminally ill. So the members in exit are generally above 50 and they may or may not be terminally ill, but it's, a, again, a debate beyond what's happening here to the situation we, you know, rational suicide has talked about. Unfortunately, I don't think the level of debate in Australia on a whole range of ethical issues concerning end of life is anywhere near as advanced as it ought to be. OK, thanks. Richard, you wanted to speak. I think part of the discussion also needs to include what sort of society we're aiming for. Um, are we aiming to have a more caring society? Are we aiming to have a more compassionate society? That, to me, lies at the very heart of what we're talking about on this topic and others. Because one of the issues of, of, of uh, where, when people are, in, uh, are, are dying is preparing them for death. Because I think a lot of people don't really know what, it's, what, what they're getting themselves in for at that point in time. And sometimes they have questions that not all of us can answer, but they certainly would like to have a discussion about those, those uh, questions which which uh, occur to them, like, what happens when I die? What, what's, it, what's it like? Now, bear in mind, no-one's really come back to tell us, but at the same time, those, those questions do come up pastorally. And so if we're going to talk about people wanting to die, I think we also have to say we as practitioners, no matter which field we come from, rather than telling them how to die, we also have to prepare them for the day when they die. And it doesn't matter if we are against euthanasia or we support euthanasia, we are against uh, the, the laws or, or for them. Because that's part of the, the relief of suffering that I was talking about earlier. Because people's psychological situation does change as they come closer to death. And some of that is fear. Mm. And I haven't really heard much of that this evening. I've heard a lot about the practice of getting people to die. But I haven't heard much about how you prepare someone to die, even if they want to die themselves. And let's face it, no matter what we say, no matter what laws are in place, if a person wants to die, they will find a way. And we've proven that quite successfully as a society and as humanity over a long period of time now. And I think it's the preparation we give which I think needs to be looked at alongside of uh, the way in which the practice 
of euthanasia may or may not be carried out in this country. Thank you. Maureen, you, you want to add to that? Certainly part of what my job is is to, pre to prepare people to die. Um, that's really hard. This society is so um, inexperienced with people dying. People in an earlier generation had people die inside their home, had lots of family. We weren't able to cure things, so they died quite young. They lost lots of family members from birth, pre-birth, all the way through to an old age. So death was something that we all had an experience of. Death now is different. The type of death that you see on the television is either us trying to save them heroically whilst we're pumping on their chests in a lift, you know, in an Grey's Anatomy and everything else like that, which is not quite reality in any way, shape or form, not but quite. or the other death of where they're lying beautifully, you know, stately in their bed and they've maybe, you know, just quietly passing away. Death comes in all sorts of forms, just like birth comes in all sorts of forms. It's not necessarily beautiful. It's not necessarily controlled either. Certainly part of my job is to try and control it as best I can. Trying to convince people to even recognise that they are dying is really quite hard when it's really obvious. And sometimes it's even hard to get doctors to recognise that people are dying as well. And I've got to tell you, I've got lots of colleagues where... Like, we get a referral four hours before someone dies. This person's been dying for weeks and weeks and weeks. And it's so deeply held in our society to not recognise that people are dying that even the medical profession's losing that skill set. What I have to do is start taking them through a journey of, you know, where they've been, because usually they don't quite understand where they've been and really what's been said to them because the language is not necessarily easy for them to understand and also then take them to where they might be going. Now, that's based on my experience of watching people die. That's my everyday job. So I see people die in all different types of manner. I see them die in ICUs. I've seen them die at home. I've seen them die in remote communities. And I hope that I can help them with an understanding of what their death might be like based on what it is that they're dealing with but it's really hard work. And some of what we need to do in this society is start recognising that dying happens. That was the first comment tonight. It's all going to happen to every one of us. We're not necessarily going to be able to choose the time of our death. Some people can. I've watched people that have gone, right, I'm out of here, and not, not, really, not have to get anything or take anything. They just are able to will themselves to die. I've seen that. I've seen that power. Gee, I hope it's me at some stage, but I can't believe that it will be. Mm -hmm. I'll be one of these horrible ladies that are delirious. <laughs> and, and I'm a doctor, and so I, you know, I'm going to be really problematic. So, um, you guys make the worst patients. So. We, are, we do, <laughs> barring nurses and lawyers. Um, so, so, politicians, maybe. Again, I'm having a good politician. So, um, so that's part of what this society needs to do. Now, I know, you know, people with... We're all here in good faith to try and facilitate comfortable death for everybody in whatever form it comes, in whichever way they've done it. I, I, you know, I'm not here to push my barrel about euthanasia or not, but I am here to push the barrel about, as a society, we need to start recognising stuff. I don't know you guys, but every time I turn on the television, there's another cure for cancer, and it drives me bananas because we're nowhere close to curing cancer. Some of them are becoming chronic diseases, but once you've actually spread cancer through your body, there is no cure. So, you know, I see this on the television all the time, this, and we, we feed into it as a society. We're paying huge amounts of money to keep people alive for another four months when it may not be improving their quality of life. I think this is an, a discussion we have to have as a society... You know, it might be great having palliative care, but really we can only do a little bit. It has to be up to everybody else to, you know, pitch in and help. I, I, just, want to, I just want to ask Maureen, though, uh, our topic tonight is euthanasia, though, and I wondered if you have had patients who've 
asked you to help them to die, or, uh, in a, you know, we, quite yeah. specifically? Uh, yes, absolutely. And we what, get desire to die statements all the time from patients. Most of it comes out of fear. And the fear of, of knowing, not knowing what it's going to be like, the fear of losing control of themselves, the fear of losing contact with others, there's a lot of fear involved in it. When we, when we have those you know, requests made to us, we explore it. And you know, I try and spend some time trying to work out where is it coming from, what's going on here. Some of it is just true fear of, of they don't want to die. They just don't want to die. Not, I don't think any of us really want to die. Um, some of it is because they, they are fearful of what might happen to them, and some of it is that you know, they f some people actually feel that they're a burden. Now, I'm not trying to push that as a thing, but it is actually real out there, people thinking that they're a burden to others. Um, so there's a lot of reasons. So we get these statements. Um, have I had patients kill themselves? Yes, I've had patients kill themselves. I've had patients kill themselves on drugs that they have been hoarding. So, you know, I'm not going to say that it doesn't happen there. Um, but, yeah, so we get them, um, and you have to try and deal with them as best you can, giving people time to say what it is that they want to say. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I Colin. just wanted to pick Richard's point up about they will find a way. Because um, often they do, and when they do, the trauma that they cause to the people who find them if they have committed suicide, like the old man recently who hung himself on the clothesline and it was his son with Down syndrome who actually found him. Um, but uh, it has come down for me, uh, having been neutral on this, whether the law should be changed for 25 years, yeah. I'm finding myself at the moment facing the fact that it's become a human rights issue because if I want euthanasia, I will know who to ask and how to ask. Um, if you're, well, I'll use the terms, this is a bit um, classist, I guess, but reasonably well-educated, reasonably well-healed and reasonably well-connected, you will have it. Why should I have access to something that the rest of the community doesn't? I shouldn't. It's a lottery at the moment about which doctor you get. Um, the people who are committing suicide often are doing it because they see no other option. They don't think there is any other way out. And as far as being a burden is concerned, one woman said to me, my whole life I've been independent and I've helped my family. If at the end of my life you force me to de be dependent and virtually destroy my family's life, in some cases the opposite. In some cases helping someone through the dying process, which I did with my sister without euthanasia, is very rewarding. But for some families it fractures them completely and the person involved knows that and say, why am I being forced to do this? In terms of helping someone through the dying process, please, 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 can you all consider being a patient advocate? On the last day of my sister's life, my, I'd been with her most of the day, she'd lost capacity. Her daughter phoned me and said, Auntie Cole, I'm sure she's in pain, and I just spoke to a nurse, and she said we gave her something two hours ago. I said, you're not telling me they're still ordering pain relief four hourly for terminally ill patients. You can't be telling me that. Um, and so I said to her, are you up for another challenge? She said, yep. I said, out to the desk, pretend you're me, and say to the nurse, my mother's in pain, that's unacceptable, please have something done about it. She did, and the nurse turned to the man standing with his back to my niece and said, Dr X, could you please check Mrs Garcia? Her daughter said she's in pain. He went in and checked her. He checked her file. He upped her morphine. He upped her midazolam, and he said to the nurses, she gets breakthrough medication every five minutes if she needs it. That was not euthanasia, and my sister died in peace. Yes. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I come in on the human rights panel? Yes, I'm... I want to hand over to you, um, the audience, to ask some questions in a minute. So can a couple of very quick comments, because I have one last one I want to ask. I'd just like to comment quickly about your statement that it's a human right to die. With rights become duties or responsibilities. So assisted suicide then imposes a duty or a responsibility on another party. Well, how do you do, how do, you do it otherwise? That is wrong. Assist do you have a right to do a handstand on this floor now? Yes, you have a right. You do not have a duty to exercise that right. We have, all have a right to life, and with that right to life comes the implicit right to die. 
does not mean I need to exercise it all the time. And one comment on what, the, what Richard said. He talked about preparing to die and we need to educate ourselves in that. All very good, all very interesting, but nothing to do with euthanasia. They missed the point yet again. The key point is, if you had one week left to live and you were in such terrible pain, agony and suffering you wanted to die, would you be allowed to do it? Under current regulation, no. Currently you can do it illegally with Philip Nitschke by accessing illegal drugs. Philip operates legally, but you can access illegal drugs. So for, as I often find, the clergy seem to bury their head in the sand about the issue of voluntary euthanasia and go on to other issues. The question is, if I am terminally ill and want to die, ought I have access to a means to end my life so that my quality of life is good and I die peacefully? I object to what okay. you say. I object for two reasons. The first is clergy do not bury their heads in the sand in the main. I've been one for 40 years. I've had to assist in the preparation of people who are dying. And that hasn't been, as, as has been said, a very pleasant experience. But what I'm also on about, when you're prepared to die, it starts at a very early age. Because one of the issues that we have, as has already been said, is that um, we don't teach our society very well about death. And that has to occur right through life, to be honest. And if you're going to reach a point where you've only got a week to live, by that stage, you should have an idea, I hope, about whether or not you are ready for this experience. And let's say the person says they're ready... So then what can you do? At the moment, nothing. I agree That's with that. That's why we need regulation. I agree with that. But what I was hearing from you was the idea of, of no one is... Um, that, that in one sense, it's too late um, by the time they reach uh, that, that very end stage. What I'm saying is, yes, it is too late, but what needs to occur is something much earlier than that, that our whole society must be geared to the idea that, yes, we do die... And we must be ready for that time. So, and, and, and accepting death in a bit more, um, with a bit more, um, a, a, have an acceptance of death, which is very much part of what life used to be like and, and is like in different cultures. People are dying now. Would you support voluntary euthanasia legislation? That's a difficult one for me as, as a Christian. It's a yes but or no answer. No, if you're in, not, if you're no, in Parliament. No, if you're no, in Parliament, I, it's yes or no answer. No, you can't put that on anyone. No. Well, people need to vote in Parliament. That's what we're asking our regulators to do, to no, vote you, for legislation if it were available. No, you okay. can't put that That's on anyone done. because the issue is not so much um, whether or not you, you assist them to die... The question is, what is the quality of life at the end? And I think that's another debate that still has to occur. Yes, and if the quality of life is not satisfactory, would you vote for voluntary euthanasia legislation? I'd probably... I don't think he has I, to I answer that I don't think he can he answer that do. question. Okay. But that's what okay. we're trying to get here, I think, with euthanasia debates in Australia, to get to the stage where do we want legislation for voluntary euthanasia and then what form of legislation that legislation should take? And the Dying with Dignity groups are working towards that. But I think that should be a minimum, and yet all the churches still oppose voluntary euthanasia, even though most Christians are supportive. What we might do at the end of the evening is do a show of hands, actually, to see how people's views have been formed or changed at the end. Um, I just want to ask one last question before throwing it over. There's lots that came out of the, this previous discussion, but um, I wanted to ask you, Sharon... Um, We've touched on a few times about the problem, if that's the right word, of protecting the vulnerable, the elderly, the people with disabilities who can't prop, maybe cannot properly communicate or to be said to be of sound mind or are able to make these sorts of decisions. What do we do about that situation and how do we regulate euthanasia? You're with Dying With Dignity. How do you regulate for that sort of situation? And does that mean that the decision is made by doctors, um, you know, and is that good? There's a number of different aspects you've covered in that. Firstly, um, people who are not mentally competent, dementia, Alzheimer's, unfortunately with the legislation that we are discussing here, they would not be covered. 
um, that is the fundamental basis of the legislation we're seeking to create is individual choice. And you need to be able to convey that and confirm that that is your wish. And unfortunately, if someone's with advanced dementia or advanced Alzheimer's, they're not in a place to do that. So the legislation we're proposing wouldn't work, and it sucks. Let's face it. For the vulnerable groups that are often mentioned, people with disability and people who are aged, I don't know if anybody's here listened to Andrew Denton's podcast that he did on Better Off Dead. He went and did a very, very thorough investigation overseas into the localities where dying with dignity legislation already exists. He also spoke to peak bodies in those localities of both age groups and people with disability and asked them, is there any evidence of them being under greater threat and so forth? And the answer was a resounding no. One of the localities, and I think it was Belgium, but I can't remember exactly, the disability group actually said the only complaint they'd had was someone with MS who felt it discriminated against them because they had to be physically capable of taking the medication. It must have been Oregon. Um, so they had someone who felt it was reverse discrimination. The aged care bodies all said it actually gave their elderly a great sense of comfort. So there was not only no evidence of these vulnerable people being at even greater risk with the legislation that's in place, there was actually greater comfort provided and a sense of empowerment that if that I fall into that situation, I have an option there. So there's no evidence to support that these groups are at greater threat. Just quickly, Marg, also, the people in the Netherlands, um, the legislation there allows a person to request euthanasia through an advance directive um, if they no longer have capacity when they reach a certain point. Um, I've checked with my colleagues over there and uh, their wishes in their advance directives are not being honoured and the reason for that is because um, a lot of the doctors over there have been hammered so much um, to make absolutely certain that they are following correct protocols and procedures um, and the protocols and procedures say a current repeated request. Now, if it's in an advanced directive, it might have been 12 or 18 months before or whatever. So they're not actually honouring the requests of people who now have dementia who asked for it in an advanced directive. Um, but the outcome of that, the negative side of that, is that many people are realising that that's the case and are therefore requesting euthanasia before they lose capacity because they know that it, before they're ready for it as well um, because they know it won't be honoured in their advance directive. So that's just another twist to the tale. Mm. Okay. Um, now we'd like to hear from you. Um, any questions that you'd like to um, ask of individual panellists or um, of the, all of the panellists? So would someone like to go first? Over there, it's a bit hard to see, but over there, yes. I've got a question for Maureen. Um, you mentioned there are some uh, palliative care patients you can't uh, adequately treat their pain uh, because it, be, it extends beyond the physical pain, prim presumably. It's more holistic, spiritual, emotional. Um, if someone is uh, suffering greatly and you're not able to relieve their pain in, in the um, last days or weeks of their life, wouldn't you put them under so that they're not suffering unbearably? Isn't that an option for you? Yes, it's, yes, it's an option. So palliative sedation is legal. It is an option. It is an option that hopefully will be discussed thoroughly with the patient beforehand if we're thinking that things are getting really quite difficult. Palliative sedation is when we actually use some um, proportional amount of medication to just make them asleep. And um, it has to be proportional. It has to be because we recognise that the symptom that they are suffering is intractable, so there is no options, or if there are options those options are considered inadequate for some reason, either because of the morbidity burden associated with that intervention or because it, the effect of that intervention 
will be delayed for some reason, so the patient will remain in distress for a while. So it's, it's something that is available. We have to be very careful as doctors to be trying to work out exactly when we facilitate this with the patient's consent and preferably with the family, very, the family and friends very aware of what we're doing. We have to prognosticate pretty well because um, you can have patients with hydration and nutrition going in without, with, terminal, uh, with palliative sedation that they're not t- bound together. They are quite separate entities that we look at. But um, trying to support somebody in that condition for weeks and weeks on end is not pleasant for them is not pleasant for their families, so we only offer that when we're pretty sure that death is very close and that there's no other options that we have. Does that answer your question? Obviously not. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Pretty well, but um, I'm just curious as to... I think we probably What's all are. What's the difference? Uh, no, um, uh, what percentage of patients would you have to use palliative sed- sedation on that you're unable to uh, treat their pain adequately? Look, personally, I don't use it very often, and that's the honest truth, um, because I'm incredibly fortunate to be able to work in a multidisciplinary team. We have, you know, I have capacity to access lots of different medications for people and I work in a private hospital so most of the patients can access things that you might not be able to access in the public system. I don't know, that's another argument. Um, It's only a small amount. I know that when you look at various studies quoted and I don't know, we do journal clubs quite often guys and I do actually have a Bachelor of Science but stats is still quite malleable (laughs) um, depending on which side of the you know, research daughter you're on or which side of the argument you're on. Um, so, you know, I know that there is some statistics that float around that in the UK it might be at least 15% of deaths, but I'm not too sure what the definition of palliative sedation is in that arena because pretty much majority of patients we will have some sort of pain relief and anxiolytic um, in place whilst they're dying because, you know, it is quite distressing for everybody. So, um, so I think that might be part of the statistics that's quoted, which is quite different than us starting up some sedation because we have an intractable problem. Um, that's quite a different thing. Maureen, in Australia, um, Professor Ian Maddox, who's considered to be the father of palliative yeah. care, said that throughout his whole career there were approximately 4% of patients whose pain he could not control well while keeping them conscious to interact with their families. But that 4% often was nothing to do with distress. It was um, real neuropathic pain. um, And um, for those patients, he administered terminal sedation. And he estimated it at 4%. Of course, 90% of the people who are being cared for out there who are dying do not have the luxury of being cared for by people like Maureen or by Professor Maddox. And that's where we need to have some focus as well. I totally support you, Maureen, and you as well, that um, we need a lot more resources into palliative care, but that won't take away the request of many people for euthanasia. You need the microphone. There you go, at the back, and then you next. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maureen, I was quite concerned to hear you say that there are options available to people in the private hospital that wouldn't be available to people in the public system at this end stage of life. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit more about that? Certainly, in in terms of some of the pain relief things, yes, that's true. So things like, you know, if somebody's got a metastatic bone cancer in their their, um, vertebrae, 
um, there's a procedure that can um, be that you can do, which is literally kind of cementing the bone back up again to take pressure off the nerves. Now, yes, you can get that a little bit in the public system, true, but in the private system, because you're paying for it, it's more available. Um, so there's, you know, just some differences and um, that may be available within a private system, as there always is in terms of, you know, if patients are paying things and we're not um, having to uh, go by government budgets, you know, and people have got their own um, allotted sums of money that they have to deal with, um, then then there's a bit more capacity as as with anything, you know, you can, I don't know, you know, public public servants don't get to drive, you know, really expensive cars because government won't pay for them, but they get to buy drive, you know, smaller models. So you kind of, you do have a little bit of, cha- of differences and maybe you can access, um, you know, chemotherapy agents that aren't being supported under the PBS, things like that. So, you know, people do have... Um, some options that are that if they've got the money, as always in life, if you've got money, you've got a few other options that might be available. But basic palliative care is not delivered much differently from rural Brisbane Hospital to Wesley or from the Northern Territory. Um, sometimes I would argue that probably palliative care is best delivered in lovely small communities where the community is involved in the care um, as opposed to, you know, because I've experienced it all, as opposed to big cities where the community is not engaged and families are stretched. So, yeah. I hope... Does that relieve some of your anxiety? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to make you anxious, but, yeah, it's just that capacity. Um, yes, the lady in front, and then there's somebody over here. Hi. I lost my father when I was 19, so I guess you could say that I have lived with the reality of death all my life. Um, My mother died of vascular dementia in her 70s, but that was a long, drawn-out, awful process. And I absolutely swore to myself then that that I wasn't going to be put in that position. I've got an advanced health care. I don't have children, so there's no one to sue any doctors if they don't do what I want. (laughs) Um, I've been to a number of the exit meetings and I know that you've got to be careful how you bring drugs in or whatever. And I always suggested to everyone, well, you know, if 5,000 of us at one time decided to import Nembital, could they really sue us all? Um, And that seemed a quite valid option to me if we could organise ourselves like that. Um, also, I was talking to um, a nurse. Ner- sorry? You have a question. <laughs> you are, I do have a question, and it's probably one that'll surprise you when I get to it, but I wanted the opportunity to also say that a nursing sister recently said to me that um, big pharma could have a, a role, pharmaceutical companies could have a role in this business of keeping all of us alive for so much longer. And that was a shock. It never really occurred to me that that could happen. But here I come to my question and I direct it to um, Richard. Um, Richard, you said, you know, like, no one's ever come back. I want to know, why didn't anyone ever ask Lazarus what it was like? Ah, that's a good question. Oh, Jesus. That's a very good question. (laughs) I must admit, though, um, that there have been occasions... I can't talk about Lazarus because, unfortunately... Um, John didn't quite document the rest of it. (laughs) But I have had um, people, including my own father, who who did have what one could call a near-death experience. And uh, one of my uh, father's um, problems when it came to to the way in which he, he faced his treatment was that he couldn't sleep until the early hours of every morning. So if uh, I was up late with him, you know, the conversation's very interesting. But he described certain things and other people have, have backed that up. And I think that's as close as we can, can get. Um, it would have been good if Lazarus had given a fuller account. Uh, it would have even been better if Jesus had given a fuller account uh, about what went on. But at the same time, um, that I don't think is... is the issue. The issue is how how do we prepare ourselves for something that is actually going to happen? It doesn't matter 
what age we are, we will die. And, and, our, and our, our ability to accept that that's going to happen, I think, is at the core of how we approach death when we're in a situation when we feel that we need to die. And in one sense, um, that is, is, is something which um, requires, I think, a societal approach, that society accepts that death is, is part of a natural part of life, for, for want of a better term, and, and, and how, we, how we approach that. It would have been great if some of those biblical characters could tell us what went on, but unfortunately we don't have that record. What we can do, though, is, is, is uh, do what we can and, and um, allow ourselves, particularly, um, and from my point of view, uh, uh, we have, um, w- working with people of faith, for example, there is that. Uh, there, are, there are certain theologies, of course, that we can we can work with. But at the same time, um, it it is something that has to occur at a, as a society, rather than waiting until or realizing that we're about to die and we need to do something about it. Richard, I actually had a near death experience, and I was with my father when he had one. So, if anyone would like to talk about it later, feel free. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Richard, lots of people are preparing themselves for death by importing illegal drugs. So if you want that still to happen, it's happening, or you can stop that happening by regulating for euthanasia. And that's the decision we, we have as a society. What do we want to happen in a regulatory sense? Yeah. And preparing yourselves and palliative care is all great. Very, very much support palliative care, very much support the work that all the doctors do, but preparing is one thing, getting to know when the situation is such that my quality of life is going to be impaired... And nobody else knows more about my life than me, so why should anyone stop me from dying in a peaceful way if I can? It would, it would be very helpful, following on from what you say, if we could actually see the legislation rather than talk about it. And, that, you know, and I say that honestly there's, there's because... There's been 26 bills around Australia. They're all supporting... And that have been all, all defeated in all the states and territories. I think most of the states and territories, except Sharon. Except in Queensland. Yeah, Queensland except in Queensland, yeah. As yet. Yes. Let's watch this space. Um, but, <laughs> but even the Victorian recent parliamentary inquiry, which proposed that Victoria legislate for voluntary euthanasia, proposed that it be for terminally ill. All the other issues about the level of compliance and how many doctors you must see, etc., that's refinement. But as a principle, if do you philosophically support the option or the right of a person to choose how to die and they should receive some medicine or a drug to help them to die if they deem that their quality of life is no longer an appropriate, um, appropriate at the end of life. OK. If you want a, a, an honest personal answer, I can't answer as a member of the church on this one, but um, I, I can say yes. Why? Because sacredness, the sacredness of life equals quality. Yes. And if there is no quality, there is no life. And that, to me, is, is at the heart of it. And, and please tell all the popes and archbishops and bishops and priests that as well. So thanks. Yeah, but I should also Lots point out, just Lots. very quickly, that, um, that in many ways, uh, if a person wants to die, they will. How can they if they don't have the drug? You don't just die. Some people do. Yeah. No, no. And, and I must admit, they deny basic it biology. <laughs> Denies evidence. You can't just. If anyone here wished that they would die now, it would not happen. It doesn't happen. You need to have a drug to help you to die peacefully. Uh, people don't would... want to get a gun. They don't want to hang themselves on a clothesline. They want a peaceful drug. I suggest you go and talk to our indigenous brothers and sisters <laughs> about that. <laughs> Could I give some examples of that? Quickly, because quickly, we've got yes. More uh, in terms of people choosing to die and die, I happen to be the granddaughter of two grandfathers who both told me, one by we'll one. Die tomorrow. Yes, my uh, my first, my grandfather. I was fourteen, and um, he'd had a loss, his his son, and uh, I was cutting his toenails. Actually, he couldn't do it himself, and he said to me, "That will be the last time you need to do that." And within six weeks, he had died. Three years later, when I was 17, I was cutting the other grandfather's hair. I know. The hair. The hair this time. 
You're not and, and he too had here. had a recent loss. His daughter and son-in-law and three children had been killed in a massive plane crash. And I was cutting his hair and he said to me, this will be the last haircut I need. And sure enough, he too died six weeks later. So... <laughs> no. Uh, no one dares come near me. <laughs> but okay. Those yeah. are true stories. Thank you. Did we have someone down the middle? Yes, there's one up. Loop, 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 Sorry, side. I'm not sure where. Yeah. Okay, there you yes. go. Yes, Hi. you. Um, we've spoken a little bit about how distressing this time is for someone's life or the end of their life. And I wanted to know what does mentally competent mean at that time? And under legislation, whose job is it to determine that they're mentally competent or not? Great question. question. Thank you. Do you want to go first? I I will. Thank you for asking that. Um, We already have frameworks in place, particularly if you think in regards to the Advanced Health Directive. That needs to be signed off by your GP saying that, yes, you understand what is in place. Now, the framework that we're proposing, there would be a number of doctors involved, and if there is any question around mental competency or even depression and that sort of thing, there would be a referral made to a psychiatrist to determine whether this person really does have the capacity and clearly understands what they're requesting for themselves. So there is already frameworks in place. Um, We've seen it also in some um, criminal cases where they're referred to a psychiatrist to be assessed whether they're mentally competent to go through the trial and what have you. So this is a framework that does already exist within Australia and it's something that we would be looking to tap into as a continuance of that. It's a very good question, but sometimes I have people say, what if the person is depressed? What if that's why they're asking? I refer you to some work done by Hooper, some very good work, where he looked at a range of people who were requesting assistance to end their lives. Um, They were assessed for depression. The only ones who changed their minds at all, and not all of them, but a small number after they were treated for the depression were those who were suffering from severe depression. Those who were suffering from mild or moderate depression did not change their minds after they were treated. And my point would be also that if I was terminally ill and in distress for whatever reason, if I wasn't depressed, I think you should send me to a psychiatrist. Um, so the, one, the other thing is that there is a test called the Mini Mental State Exam, and if any of you use it, I'll be stalking you down and re- wiping you out. Um, It's used as a capacity assessment instrument. It is not a capacity assessment instrument. It's a screener, and it's a faulty tool. I once asked one of my research assistants if I could administer it to her, and she came in borderline competent. She wasn't. I asked a medical student to take seven from 100 and keep taking seven from the results till I told him to stop. He said, not without my calculator. I asked someone else to spell world backwards. She said, I'm a rotten speller. I probably couldn't even spell it forwards. On the basis of such students, Stupid questions. People are deprived of their rights to make their own decisions and that's unethical. One of the questions is, who's the Prime Minister? One old man said, who cares? (laughs) Julie? I'm just uh, interested in the concept of advanced health directives and the need at that point to have a uh, mental assessment or a psychological assessment about your competency to make that decision. Because it's very easy to, to be here today in a fit and healthy state and objectively talk about uh, euthanasia. And, and I might decide now, no one wants to look down the pathway and think that they might be in suffering and pain. And they might very easily want to sign a health directive at that time being in a competent state. But why I think the doctors that you were referring to, who was talking about the doctors in, um, you were, weren't you, being so uh, careful in Holland to assess the competency of the patient, is because we know that as it gets closer for us, it then becomes a subjective choice. And we're not quite so keen, necessarily, to stay with our commitment we made way back then. And I think that's why it's important to consider the mental health of the person at the time. Could I just, could I just um, make a comment? Very quickly, yeah, there's quite I'd, a few I'd, hands up. I get asked to assess people's competency all the time. There are other tests other than the mini mental state score. Yes. Yeah, I agree, it's not a great test. There's a lot of them out there. Um, 
just to scare the living daylights out of you all, is that you're not just competent and incompetent. You can actually have fluctuating capacity, and that can actually happen in a day. And it depends on what you're actually trying to get capacity for. So, you know, if you want to just... If I just had to assess you for capacity to decide that you're going to have a haircut, probably not that hard. If I was going to have to assess you for a competency for um, euthanasia or refusing treatment or anything else like that, um, I think it's actually quite tricky for us to make a one assessment in one point in time where you could actually be having some delirium or you could actually be not depressed but demoralised. They're actually quite separate things. Not everybody that asks for, for um, the desire to die is depressed. Sometimes they can just be sh sheer demoralised by everything that's, ex that's happening to them. So I'm sorry. Um, I find the, uh, the argument about competency and getting a whole bunch of psychiatrists and everything to do it a little bit tricky sitting on the side that I sit. That's all. Thank you. Okay, over here. To my, my left, yes? No? Okay, there's, is there a, a microphone down there? Sorry, um, my question is directed at the lady with a scarf. Um, yeah, just in Julie. your introduction, Julie, sorry. Um, you were talking about. Um, oh. Sorry. Um, sorry. Oh, you were talking about um, the, the worth of life and um, how you think euthanasia is involved in that. And I just thought, what about choice? Like, how does that come into it? Do you not think that choice... Like, if you take away someone's um, right to choose whether or not they want to end their life, is that not, you know, part of the argument there? It's terribly interesting, isn't it? Because uh, the argument can be that I have a choice to die. But having made that uh, decision or that action, I have no more further choices, do I? I've actually denied myself, <laughs> if you think about it. Um, I think everyone would say that uh, while... Um, and one of the major arguments for uh, euthanasia is always to do with autonomy... I have a right to choose. But we are not individuals. We are part of a society. And my choices about my life do impact on my family and on my society. And I think that's why the Hippocratic Oath, way before Christian times, was there, that doctors did not have a right uh, to take... There are some intrinsic rights we don't have, and one of them is that right to choose. Sorry, just quickly, the Hippocratic Oath also says you should never tell your patients what's wrong with them. Um, and the Hippocratic Oath says you should always respect your lecturers. I'd go with that one. <laughs> There's another thing too. Not all doctors swear to the Hippocratic Oath these None days. None of them do anymore. Yep. They don't even yep. read it out anymore. No. And I find yeah. it really disgusting that somebody says that I'm not in control of my own life and I do not have choice of my own life. Of course I do. Can I just add a comment in relation to this is sometimes the view that this is not just the person's choice but it, there's, they've got a family around them and they've got a community around them. I had an experience with my own father who um, sort of hero-worshipped Ernest Hemingway, the writer. And Ernest Hemingway was a very macho sort of guy who was a, a hunter and fought in the war and... Um, you know, was very charismatic sort of person. And when Her Ernest Hemingway was diagnosed with terminal cancer, he shot his brains out in the kitchen with his wife in the next room. And I remember my father's hot shock at that event and his shock that this man who he had felt was brave and courageous and strong um, would, would take that decision... And, you know, he thought and talked about that a lot to the extent that, you know, now years later I remember that conversation that he had with us kids very strongly. So people, we're not islands. We do act in, um, this is my two bobs worth, we do act within a group and a community. And I think we need to always remember that. It's not just what I want for me. It's also what about my kids and my siblings and... All of that sort of stuff. Can I ask you one quick story? Um, at, uh, one of the speakers at the No Euthanasia Conference down in Adelaide I went to last year was a man called Tom Mortimer. And his story was that uh, 
His mother was 64 and uh, she was someone who went in and out of depression and she had spoken to him about three months earlier, said, oh, she thought she might investigate euthanasia. He had no further contact with her or discussion about it until the university in Brussels rang him up to say his mother had um, undertaken euthanasia the day before and we need now come and take the body to the morgue. Now, he spoke about his grief, his grief that his children would not grow to know their grandmother or, or his grandmother enjoy the children, but also his grief, I suppose, of, of not being able to care for his mother in a greater way, to have not picked up the cues. I mean, he suffered a lot of you know, pain and anguish, and it's generational, him and his children. It wasn't just a singular choice by some person about themselves. That, that, is, um, not a, that is not an argument against voluntary euthanasia. That's an argument against, against death. Everyone will die. This person would have died anyhow. We want an argument against voluntary euthanasia, and there is none yet. Okay. That's more an argument against a dysfunctional family, and we could come out with squillions of stories of other families who are traumatised because of the suffering they've seen their loved ones go through because voluntary euthanasia is not available. We could go story for story, I'm yeah, tipping. Yeah. So the gentleman down here, and there's a lady in black down under the light who's had a hand up for ages, so if yeah. someone could get a microphone there. Yes, my, thank you. My question's to the whole panel, and it relates to the practical application of something like euthanasia in Queensland, and it was touched on about equity of access. Now, Queensland's a large state, and if you're living in a rural property and maybe two hours' drive from a town where you have a registered nurse and no doctor, and you may get a GP come in one week every month, how are people going to have access to the many medical professionals that may be needed to sign off something like euthanasia? Are we overcomplicating the practice of what can be a personal choice or maybe relying on the GPs in the community who actually know their patients? Who'd like to take that one? OK. Um, very good question. Um, and it, in fact, um, was reflected in the Northern Territory. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen the, either the movie or the stage play or whatever, Last Cab to Darwin, um, where the um, gentleman from Broken Hill got in his taxi and Max Bell and drove all the way to Darwin um, and whenever he stopped for petrol he was so ill that he fell out on the road and people thought he was drunk. Um, and when he got up to Darwin... Um, the, um, he couldn't, Philip Nitschke couldn't get a palliative care specialist who would agree to see him um, and one finally flew up from Sydney I think it was but in the, uh, for, for another patient um, but for Max after a while he said to Philip you didn't do your homework son and he signed himself out of the Darwin Hospital and drove back to Broken Hill where he'd already had his pets put down and sold his furniture, etc. What that story doesn't show and very few people know, and, and I have problems with some of what Philip does, but in this case he followed him back and cared for him, not gave him euthanasia, but cared for him till he died um, because he couldn't do it through the system. So yes, if you are living in a remote area access will be more difficult. Um, but I guess if we're talking about preparing for death, if you think that's what you're going to want to do, then you'd have to contact an organisation such as Exit and ask for assistance. But let's hope people don't have to do that if they are being well supported where they are. Prepare early. Prepare in your 30s and 40s and 50s because it will happen one day. And, yes, it's not going to be, not going to be easy. Mm. So either... Uh, go to your regulators, make statements to your politicians so we can regulate people voluntary euthanasia or join exit. Yes, the lady down the back. Hi. Uh, Julie, my question is directed at you as well. Um, I don't know how to do this. OK, hi. Um, I, like you, I'm a mother and I'm a Christian and I have lost a close family member this year to terminal illness. Now, <laughs> my question for you is this. What, if, if euthanasia is regulated and legalised, how does that take away from your right to say that you don't want to do it? And if it doesn't, in fact, take away from your right to say no, what gives you the right to tell others they don't have the right to choose yes, in your opinion? Hold on. Give her back the mic, because I just want a clarification. Are you talking about um, if euthanasia is legal... 
the, so the person can choose that. Um, the right of the other person or the responsibility of the other person or what are you meaning? Can she have the mic so we can hear? Okay, so if euthanasia is regulated and legalised... Yes. ..and obviously you're opposed to this so you're not going to make that decision for yourself... Yes. ..why is it not okay for other people to make that decision for their, themselves? Obviously we, we come from a diverse country, we have different belief systems, etc. Why is your belief that people shouldn't do this? And you've referred to it several times as suicide, which I find offensive... Uh, in and of itself, particularly when you were saying these youth won't have, you know, they're not old enough to fight for their country, they're not old enough to vote. They're going to die anyway. They're dying. It's not pretty. It's a fact. So why are we then taking people's choice about how, where and when that happens? Because it's going to happen. It's inevitable. I think we all agree to that. So why... Uh, is it all right for you to say, because I personally don't want to make this decision, this should be a blanket concept? Like, what about that do you feel gives you that right? All right. So let's go back to the definition of suicide. It is assisted. No, no, the definition of euthanasia is assisted death. So straight away we've got the concept of two people, right? It could be assisted in giving you access to the drugs... Yeah, that's still two people. One person has given you the means to the end. So uh, when we regulate uh, for um, suicide, we make euthanasia legal in a society, you then have that society needing to impose the duty. And we had a situation, or they had a situation in Belgium in 2014 where a 74-year-old lady living in a nursing home Yes, with cancer, so probably had a period, you know, she was in the final, I don't know, she had a terminal illness, I don't know how long she was going to live. And she requested the Catholic nursing home, of the Catholic nursing home, to euthanise her. They disagreed on conscientious objection rules. Her family took her out, took her home, where she died in peaceful surroundings. They then sued that Catholic nursing home uh, for... um, uh, extra physical and mental anguish, I think, was the term on the mother. And three judges uh, found that Catholic nursing home, fined that Catholic nursing home at three thousand euros, and said they had no right to withhold euthanasia on the grounds of conscientious objection. So, do you what I'm, do you know what I mean? You're giving I the right to one person, but you're taking it there, away Jerry. from another group of people or another person. I think not having all the information on that case, I wouldn't like to comment. Obviously, you're comfortable doing that. Um, Okay. But (laughs) the only thing that I would say to that is if you don't want to help someone, don't. If you you object and someone asks you to assist, you still have the right to say no. So, again, I have to ask you, how does your right to say no overrule other people's right to choose yes? Yes. Because it's still the same thing. You know, someone... I, look, I'll put my hand up now. This becomes legalised. Someone wants to go. I'll help you. Just saying. There are people who are willing to go through that. Nobody's asking you personally to do that. So if you don't want to do that, don't. But how does that change everybody else's input in that? Uh, um, and I, I agree... I agree, and if it was only ever between you and the person who agreed to assist you, I would say, you know, that's two people, and I'm not going to judge those two people. But, for instance, in Canada, they have just... Can I just give you an example why? In Canada, they have just implemented what they call um, enforced uh, legal euthanasia. Now, the doctors and the nurses are concerned about that because if someone has an enforceable right to be euthanised, is it then going to put pressure on doctors and nurses who don't want to participate? So it's still to do with the duties of one and the rights of another. The Canadian legislation does say that people can object, but they have to refer the person to someone else. You know when we debate legalising equal marriage, for example, Hmm. are you the person that says we're going to marry animals? Because that is a completely separate issue. You're saying that this one specific case here in Belgium is somehow 
relevant to what is happening here in Australia, and it's not. We're not talking about that specific legislation. We're talking about how Australia would regulate and legalise euthanasia. Decriminalise. Decriminalise, thank you. It's not the same thing. You know, we can get into semantics yeah. of specific yeah. cases. Hang on, Richard, but I'd like to say yeah. something. As yeah. a blanket issue, mm. I think, yeah. yeah. Please. Okay. Can, can I butt in? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest way. I mean, you put some very good points. Uh, the exercise of, of, of free will, which is really at the heart of all theology. Uh, it's, it's one of the great things we have as, as human beings, the, 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 the right of free will, to exercise our free will in the way that we believe it to be exercised. And it doesn't matter if we are people of faith or not people of faith. It, it works in the same manner. The other side of it is if, if it... If, for example, euthanasia became legalised in this uh, um, in the, in this state, uh, of course we'd have to respect those who'd want to um, exercise their right in that respect, and those who didn't want to exercise their right in that respect. And um, I must admit, uh, the that will probably put church some church-run institutions such as hospitals and aged care facilities into um, a bit of a quandary at that moment in time because they themselves will have to work out uh, as part of their institutional approach how to deal with that situation as it arises. But on the personal line, we have to respect those who don't want to uh, seek euthanasia and those who do if, it's, if, if the legislation is in place. And, and, and certainly your question was... I wasn't quite sure if it was from the personal perspective or from the, um, from the wider perspective, but from a personal perspective, of course we have to uh, uh, um, be, be mindful of the, uh, of the desires of people to either uh, want to seek assisted euthanasia or not want to seek. But uh, in one sense, I dare say the facilities should be available, both palliative care and, and um, the... the, the um, the means by which um, assisted euthanasia can be conducted. Both have to be available so that people can ab be able to exercise what they choose to uh, under the law if it comes into being. Okay. Does that help? That does. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Down the back and then to up yes, here. Yes, please. Um, Ernest Hemingway... Um, wasn't afraid of death. He was afraid of the way that he would die. Mm. This is a big, strong, macho man by your own words. What he did to his wife is unforgivable. Had there been legalised assistance for him to die, would he have really chosen to do that to himself and what he did to his wife? I'll take that as a rhetorical question. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyone else? Some people up here. Oh, nobody can hear you. I'm sorry, you need a microphone? Or... Maiden needs yeah. it first. <laughs> it was meant to be a question. In countries overseas where euthanasia has been legalised, has the incidence of people hanging, jumping in front of trains and jumping off the back of ocean cruises, which I've heard is someone's plan that I know, has that been shown to decrease? Can anyone answer that? Yes. Well, I mean, we're probably going to have a different response to this. Um, I've been looking at the Remelink reports every um, year, every time they've come out. Um, the incidence of... When you say has it decreased, we all often forget that we have increasing numbers of deaths in each country. So if you give a number and you say there's been six more, you're not looking at the percentage of the overall deaths as a society ages. But as a percentage, no, it, it has gone down. And what has gone down dramatically in the Netherlands is the percentage of deaths um, out of the, the total number of deaths 
um, of people whose life has been ended without a, um, a request, a specific request. And, you know, I, I support the point that was made earlier. In many cases, the person is no longer competent uh, and is clearly in um, extreme distress um, and family members have asked if they can be assisted to die. But the actual percentage of deaths in that category has definitely gone down, and you can just go to the Remlink reports and follow it. And, and I'd just like... I, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, all right. Um, a study published in a 2005 American Southern Medical Journal, and it was looking at those states in America where euthanasia is legal... It's not legal in America. Oregon. That's yep. not. Some that's physician-assisted suicide. Yep. There physician. is no euthanasia in the in America. All right. I'll call it physician-assisted suicide. Uh, it showed there was a clear uh, correlation between suicide and physician-assisted suicide. So, as the in those states where there was phys- physician-assisted suicide, there was a higher uh, total amount of suicides. I'm not quite sure what that connection is, but uh, I think we'll move on. Thank you. Well, just to support what Julie said, um, some studies, um, and you'd have to look at the quality of the study, have suggested that um, by legalising physician-assisted suicide, it has made suicide generally more accepted by the society. And that's the point I think Julie was making. But a southern state in 2005, I'd be really wanting to look hard at the quality of that research. Okay. A question here in the front. Uh, Good evening. I just want to make a statement, if I may. My name's Maida Lilly and I'm one of a very small group of people who started politics in the pub, and I try to come every time. But I'd like to make a... I just feel we've been talking such a lot around a lot of dying, and I'm in my 80s, and I hope it's a good way away, and I'm working hard to keep it that way. But um, uh, euthanasia, we really should have a decent, controlled euthanasia, I think. But... Please, we've been talking about advanced health directives ad nauseum. Now, Colleen will know because she wrote, along with someone from the Justice Department, the Health uh, um, Department. She was No, you, you were with the university, weren't you? I was seconded uh, from the university into the Department of Justice. To, that's right. Um, and, and, out and came the, directives we designed. the advanced health directive. And at that time, I was on the board of National Seniors Australia and I had 23 <laughs> branches as I was a zone chair. And I took that form around because it was so user-friendly, awful. I was a linguist of kinds and user-friendly, but it was. And, but I discussed it with my family and with my doctor. I have still got that form, but I update it regularly. For goodness sake, the fact that I signed it in the 90s when I was a new retiree, And my family had a bit of a giggle, but mum had always been pretty uh, down at earth and and did what she felt was needed. But for goodness sake, I just saw my doctor last week and said, is it time to do it again? And she flipped it over and said, oh, no, not till next year. (laughs) And as for competency, I've been on a lot of medical committees and researchers locally, statewide, federally, and aged care... um, uh, groups that, that uh, were all medical except for me and I got sick of standing up at conferences and saying your uh, competency I have Harvard uh, degrees which allows me to do competency testing and uh, of every kind and I look at these silly things when they come and say repeat these two, three but the two or three words in half an hour <laughs> and everybody on the panel is sitting nodding and then dear old Norman Swan comes along and says, for God's sake, get consumers like Maida. But please, if you've got a, a, a health a directive, you check it all the time. Your family know what you want and the only time you really need it is if you're non compass mentis anymore, please let me go. So and and Maida, needs... if they haven't got an advanced directive, ask them why, because they're not just for older people. No. Anyone could be injured in a car accident. My daughter has one, you won't be surprised, mm-hmm. and she's a lot younger than most of you. But, but also, 
when we did it with national seniors, you can be a national senior from 50 on. All my kids are more than 50. Uh, so for goodness sake, and they held a euthanasia um, um, questionnaire with over 200,000 members, one of the biggest uh, groups in the whole of the Southern Hemisphere, and overwhelmingly in the 90s, National Seniors members said, please look at euthanasia. So there, it's around and we don't have to wait for Andrew Denton, although it was an excellent talk, but the ABC didn't even bother to repeat it, and it was Wednesday at half past 12 in the middle of the day it for is the press club, on my view. and it was at midnight over the weekend, and I was mean enough to stand uh, myself up and blink a bit, but I said it. And I saw it, and it was excellent. For goodness sake, it's been around for half my lifetime. Do something about it. Thank you. I don't know whether you heard um, Sharon, but it is on iView. It is ABC iView. His presentation. He's also through the GoGent website. There is a downloadable script. It has been transcribed, and it is available in printed form if you're wanting access to it as well. We've got time for about one or two questions more. One over there. Can, can you hear me? And one down the back, OK? Sorry, I've been waiting a long time. I've actually nearly forgotten my question, and now I've got <laughs> more questions than I had at the beginning, and I don't want this to continue to be teacup politics all night. And I do wonder, where are the lawyers if we're asking illegal questions? Um, should there be a referendum on this? I mean, at the end of the day, if we're, we're talking legal issues, I have a couple of questions and some points. Um, issues like agency, burden of proof, 